All right, and welcome to Unit 3, Overreacting. Uh, we're going to be going through all these wonderful topics. We're going to be looking at atomic structure, periodic table, making molecules, and a whole range of different chemical reactions uh, in this unit. So we're going to get started, and we're going to jump right into atomic structure. You can see here on the screen um, all the learning intentions and success criteria for this so let's get started. All matter is made up of atoms. Atoms are made of three subatomic particles. They are protons, neutrons, and electrons. However, most of an atom is actually empty space. Now there's a really cool little science snippet over here that talks about how if an atom was actually the size of the Melbourne Cricket Ground, the MCG, um, and you had a, a frozen pea, and you took that into the center of the MCG, um, that frozen P could be your nucleus. It's about the right size. Um, whereas the rest of the MCG is actually the rest of the atom. However, your electrons, to give you an idea of scale, the electrons are like the specks of dust that are floating around in the stands. And in between those specks of dust and that frozen P in the center, uh, basically nothing would exist. And, and it's quite a lot of the atom is absolutely nothing. Uh, it, it's not filled with air. Air is made up of molecules and, and other atoms. So it's actually just made up of nothing. It's a complete vacuum in between the electrons and the nucleus where your protons and neutrons are. So it's really interesting to think that all matter is made up of atoms, but most of those atoms is actually empty space. So really, most matter is made up of nothing. It's a bit of a, a freaky concept. Anyway, this is sort of what we're talking about. So you can see here in the center, we have our protons and our neutrons. And this is what we call the nucleus. It's quite small. It's very, very dense. It's in the center of the atom. Uh, most of the mass of the atom, if not all the mass of the atom, comes from this part. Um, and so your protons, we can look at them in a little bit more detail. Uh, like we just said, they're in the nucleus and they have a positive electrical charge. Now this is really easy to remember because protons are positively charged. Protons are positively charged. Neutrons, on the other hand, again, they're on the nucleus, but they actually don't have any electrical charge. And we can remember that by thinking that neutrons are neutral. Neutrons are neutral. They don't have a charge. And they're pretty much the same mass as a proton, basically the same size. If a proton weighs one, then a neutron also weighs one. Our little electrons are whizzing all around this nucleus. They're in what we call the electron cloud. And uh, they're tiny. They have a mass um, one, one eighteen hundredth of, of the proton. And our electrons are where the negative charge is. Um, so what's handy with electrons is because in an atom, your atom has overall no charge. Um, we know that with atoms, uh, any protons we have are fully counterbalanced by our electrons. So we actually know, if we know how many protons we have, we know that we have the same number of electrons because electrons are equal in number to the number of protons in an atom. Now, a bit of a warning, that can vary, but when that varies, we don't call it an atom anymore, we call it an ion. So protons, electrons, neutrons are our three subatomic particles. And it's really important you know where they are, what charge they have, and approximately what size they are as well. All right. Moving on, we've established that all atoms are made up of protons, neutrons, and electrons. But the properties an atom has is affected by how many of these it has. And if you mess with how many uh, protons there are or how many neutrons or how many electrons there are in an atom, you can actually change some really key characteristics of that atom. But changing one of them affects that atom differently to changing the others. For example, if you take uh, the protons and let's say you take away some protons or maybe you smush some in and you add more, you'll actually create a different element. And this is because the element of an atom is defined by how many protons it has. For example, um, lithium has three protons and that's what makes it lithium, whereas beryllium has four protons and that's what makes it beryllium. So it's really important that you know that the, if you mess with the number of protons in an atom, you're actually going to give yourself a different element. On the other hand, uh, neutrons 
don't have an effect like this. Uh, and neither do electrons. If you mess with neutrons or you mess with the number of electrons, you won't be changing the element. The element stays the same. That doesn't differ. But if you do mess with how many neutrons there are, you'll give yourself what we call a different isotope. Now, this is an atom. It's the same element um, as whatever it started as, but it weighs a different amount because now it might have more or it might have less neutrons. And remember, neutrons and protons are what contribute to how much the atom weighs. So you end up with uh, an atom of the same element, but different number of neutrons and a different mass overall. And we call this an isotope. And we'll end up looking at that in a little bit more detail later on. Finally, if you mess with the number of electrons and you either take some away or you add some electrons, this is what I was saying before, where you get an ion. Same element, but now we have a charge to it. Now, because electrons are negatively charged, when we get extra electrons, overall, our ion will become more negative. Whereas if we lose electrons, overall, our ion will be more positive. So... That's a little thing, again, to note there that you can get positive or negatively charged ions depending on whether you uh, lose or you gain electrons. So this is what happens when you mess with the numbers of those uh, different subatomic particles. We're going to dive into the structure a bit further. Specifically, we're going to be looking at um, what we call electronic arrangement. Uh, this is just where the electrons are and how we place electrons around the nucleus. And there's a few different levels we can look at this at. So starting basically, um, electrons are found in what we call shells. And shells are basically uh, these energy levels around the nucleus of an atom. And these energy levels are really specific with how many electrons they can have. Um, this is a bit of a spelling error here. That shouldn't say specific number of atoms. It should say electrons. So just watch out for that. Um, our first shell, which is sometimes called K, its absolute maximum number of electrons it can hold is two. So that would be the shell that both hydrogen has it and helium has it, and it can only hold two electrons. And helium happens to have a full first shell, and it actually has two electrons. If we move up and we add another shell or another energy level where we can put electrons, uh, this is sometimes called L, it has a maximum of eight electrons. So the second shell can hold an absolute max of eight electrons overall. Our third shell, which is sometimes called M, has an absolute maximum of 18 electrons. Um, and then we have our fourth shell, which has an absolute maximum of 32 electrons. And you can see there, it's sometimes called N as well. Uh, this is probably less common uh, in the work we will do, that sort of naming, the K, L, M, and N, but it's just there in case you see it and you wonder what's going on on a diagram or something like that. That's what they are. K means 1, L means 2, M means 3, and N means 4. Over here, we have a diagram of calcium. And so calcium has four shells. It has two in its first shell, because that's the maximum it can hold. It's got uh, 20 electrons overall it needs to find homes for. So it's got its first two in the first shell. It puts eight into the second shell here. So that's 10 we've found homes for. So we've got another 10. Now, if you look over here, we would think that we can put all of those 18 electrons in, uh, sorry, all of those 10 electrons in the third shell because it can hold a maximum of 18. However, there is a little quirk when it comes to shells that we're gonna to touch on a bit. And so it actually means that the third shell here in this diagram only has eight electrons and then they have a fourth shell where there is uh, another two electrons and that brings us up to 20 overall. So we're going to move on and we're going to get into how we draw these shell diagrams in more detail and we're going to uh, work out and learn why there is this bit of a weird quirk in this diagram and why uh, that third shell doesn't actually have uh, 10 electrons where it has 10 electrons it needs to place and instead only has eight so um, we're really only going to focus on the first 20 uh, atoms or, or elements, sorry, um, because after the first 20, there are even stranger happenings when it comes to filling up the shells. But basically, um, the first 20 electrons can be drawn by following um, these rules. Shell one has a maximum of two electrons. And then the most electrons a shell on the outside, or what we would call a valence shell will hold, is eight. So if your shell is the last shell, 
It is currently the outermost shell. It's not going to hold more than eight electrons. And this has to do with it being stable. So if it has more than eight electrons and it's the outermost shell, it's not stable. So what happens is once you get to that eight or a shell gets full, a new shell is added and the electrons are now being placed in there. If it's a case of you have um, the third shell, which could have t uh, 18 electrons and you've got 10 electrons you still need to ho find homes for, you'll put eight into there. Now it's got a full uh, outer shell of eight. So you create a fourth shell, pop two in, and then beyond the first 20 elements, you'd then start backfilling uh the third shell and coming back and filling it up to the full 18. so something that's a bit simpler is silicon it's got 14 electrons we put two in the first shell then eight in the next shell now shell two is full and we've got four left so we put four into shell three and we draw it like the diagram over here now if you can't remember the maximum number of electrons that the shell can hold, that's okay. There is a little bit of maths you can do to work it out. You can use this equation, 2n squared. So take your shell number, 1, 2, 3, 4, whatever it is, and pop it in where n is in this equation. Then you square it, for example, 1 squared is 1, and then you multiply it by 2. So 1 times 2 is 2. So that tells us shell 1 can hold 2. If we were to do it for, say, shell 3, you put 3 in there, 3 squared is 9, and then 9 times 2 is 18. And that matches with what we were looking at before. Shell 3 holds a maximum of 18. So if you see the term electronic configuration, just remember this is just meaning the distribution of electrons in their shells. All you are doing is just writing out where you find electrons in what shells. Now this might be by drawing uh, a Bohr diagram, which are these diagrams down the bottom here. Or that might be as simple as writing it out like this that we have here for sodium, where sodium has 11 electrons and they're placed in 2, 8 and 1. All right. So depending on a question you get in a test or an exam, uh, look at what it's actually saying and what it's asking you to do. If we want you to draw a shell diagram, it will actually tell you to show it by drawing a shell diagram. Otherwise, you can generally just write them out in this format here. So as I was saying before, there are some important rules. Shells fill up one at a time, unless in doing so, that means an outer shell or what we call a valence shell is going to have more than eight electrons. And by having more than eight, it would become unstable. So uh, once a outer shell reaches eight electrons, you actually have to establish a new outer shell. And the only way to establish a new outer shell completely is to make that shell and have two electrons in it. Once you do that, you can then come back and finish up filling the shell beforehand. So you can see here, going through these elements, how the shells are filled. So particularly here, if you go chlorine, uh, argon, potassium, you've got 17 uh, electrons, 18 electrons, 19 electrons uh, progressively through them. So chlorine goes 2, 8, 7. Argon goes 2, 8, 8. And then potassium, instead of going 2, 8, 9, because that last shell here with argon, that third shell, is currently the outermost shell, um, if you have nine in there, it'll be unstable. So what happens is they need to establish a new outer shell. So that's what's going to happen with that next electron. It's going to go into a fourth shell. And if you continue on, calcium's next, and that then will be 2882, where we have two electrons being established in that fourth shell. If you were to go on to scandium, which is the one out for the calcium, it would go 2892. And now you can come back to that third shell and start putting more electrons in because it's no longer the outermost shell and a fourth shell has been established as the outermost shell. So that can be, uh, you can come back and fill the previous shell. Now we're going to get into a little bit more detail with how these shells get filled and why they get filled the way they do. So we're actually going to move from shells to looking at what we call subshells. So each of these shells are actually composed of smaller uh, energy levels. A shell is a bit like an energy range um, rather than a precise level. So a shell is kind of like an energy range and the subshells are actually those specific energy levels. So according to quantum mechanics, electrons actually move in orbitals that fill shells and subshells. We're going to briefly talk about orbitals because orbitals are even being more specific about our subshells, but we're not going to touch on it for too long. So instead of traveling around the nucleus in neat circles, electrons actually fill up an area of space. So there's 
what happens is that there is a 3D area of space that electrons can be living in. Uh, it's not just a little circle on a piece of paper. They've got this 3D area of space. This is our subshell or our orbital. There's somewhere in there. Now, the number of the shell is equal to the number of subshells it holds. So what this means is shell one can have one subshell, shell two has two subshells, and shell three has three subshells, and, and you can go on from there. So we actually label these guys a bit differently. So shells are just numbered one, two, three, four, five, six, whatever. Whereas subshells have some specific letters and we're interested in the first three types of subshells. There is an S type, a P type and a D type. Um, if you go on to doing chem higher up, you'll also learn about F type subshells. But S type subshells, these guys can hold two electrons. Okay, P-type subshell, subshells can hold up to six electrons. D-type subshells can actually hold up to 10 electrons. Now, for those who are interested, there is a reason to this. Subshells have orbitals. So orbitals are an even deeper way of breaking these guys down. Uh, this is what we've got down here. S has one orbital, P has three orbitals, D has five orbitals. And all orbitals hold two electrons. So if you want to know how many uh, electrons subshell S can hold, well, it would be one times two. So it can hold two electrons, which is what we set up here. If you want to know how many electrons a P subshell can hold, it would be three times two, which is six. Again, that's what we set up here. And if you want to know what D can hold, it would be five times two, which is 10 electrons. And there we go. That's what we have there. So that's the reasoning behind it. But for most of you, you're only going to need to know this first sort of dot point that S can hold two, P can hold six, and D can hold 10. And the nice thing is we do this so much and there's a nice pattern with it that gets really stuck in your head as well. So each subshell is a specific energy level and they fill up in order of increasing energy. All that means is that the low energy ones fill up first and the high energy ones fill up last. Now, there is a bit of a funny thing and it's not perfect separation between some of the subshells um, up and higher energy levels. So if you look at the diagram here, you've got one S down the bottom. One S is, uh, one means shell one and the S means it's an S subshell. So shell one's S subshell, we've got that here. Then we move up in energy and we get to two S. This is a subshell S that belongs to shell two. Moving up from that, we have two P. This is subshell P that belongs to shell two. If we move up again, we go to 3S, so shell 3, and it is the S subshell. Moving up again, we've got 3P, so this is shell 3, P subshell. Now, this is where things go a bit funny. Instead of going straight up to 3D like we normally expect because we're going uh, up in the shells, we actually go over to 4S because 4S is a subshell happens to have a little bit less energy than 3D does. So we go up to 4S, and once this gets filled, then 3D gets filled. And this is the reason why we have that weird quirk around scandium and calcium, why it suddenly creates a fourth subshell when the third isn't at its actual maximum capacity. And that's because it needs to go and it needs to fill up this 4S before it comes back to finish up filling shell to, uh, 3 and filling up what would actually be the 3D subshell. And if you keep going up, you'll find it goes uh, 4S, 3D, 4P, 5S, 4D, 4F. Um, we're not going to be doing anything up here. At most, we'll get close to 4S. Um, and that's about as high as we go for the content we're doing. But this is just a bit of an overview as to how those energy levels actually fill up. Another way you could look at that is to write it out like this. So shell one has, uh, you've got 1S, 2 has 2S and 2P. 3S has 3S, 3P, 3D, 4, 4S, 4P, 4D, uh, 4F, and it keeps on going. And the way it gets uh, filled is by, we go in this direction. So it goes 1S, then 2S, 2P, 3S, 3P, 4S, 3D, 4P, 5S. And you follow those arrows uh, to fill them up. Uh, it's a little uh, handy diagram to help you remember how to do it. Now, Filling subshells is all fine and dandy, but how do we actually write out what we're talking about? Well, there's a specific little format that we use and it's what's shown here. So we have a big number and that tells us the shell we're talking about. We have a letter that tells us the subshell, so S, P or D. Uh, 
And then we have this number that's uh, what we call a superscript. So it's up the top and it's just a little number. And that little number, that superscripted number is how many electrons there actually are in that subshell. And so here we can see zinc uh, has a whole heap of electrons it needs to find homes for. And so it goes 1s2, because there's two electrons in that subshell, in the 1s1. It goes 2s2, because it's two electrons in the 2s, 2p6, for the six electrons in 2p, 3s2, there's two electrons in 3s, 3p6, uh, 4s2, 3d10. And so you can go through and you can add them all up and you should get uh, 2, 4, uh, 10, 12, 18, 20, 30 electrons. And if you look, you should see on the periodic table, you should see that zinc should have 30 electrons. And so that's how they actually get placed. Now, again, um, I can't stress this enough. We will not be going to this high. Something that goes up to 4s2 would be the highest that we will be covering in our work. So get used to this pattern up to 4s2. Um, if you have a lower level uh, atom or element, all you do is you stop at the point that you're uh, finished with. So what this might look like is we've got some examples here for this activity. Now, I'm going to go through these examples and you can, if you haven't done this, pause the video and go through and see if you can work these out. And I'll really quickly pop up the answers for you after that. But over here, you can see we've got sodium, which has 11 electrons. And so we go 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s1, because that is 2, 4, 10, 11 electrons. Oxygen here goes 1s2, 2s2, 2p4, because you've got 2, 4, 8 electrons. Hopefully this is starting to make sense. You can see the pattern and what's happening here. Silicon's 14. And so we go 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p2. You've got 2, 4, 10, 12, 14 electrons. All right, so pause the video now and work through fluorine, magnesium, argon, and calcium's uh, subshell configuration. Alrighty, how did you go? Uh, we're going to go through and we're going to have a bit of a go at this. So uh, fluorine has nine, so we're going to go one uh, S, oh, that's not a very good S, one S, uh, two, two S, two, two P, and then we've got two, four, so that leaves us with five to place. We're going to put a five here. So that's fluorine. Magnesium, we're going to go do the same thing. 1s2, 2s2. We're going to go 2p6. And then this brings us up to 2, so we're going to go 3s2. All right. So, sorry, I'm just going to get rid of them so I've got a bit more space to work. But we're going to do argon and we're going to go 1s2. So argon's got 18. 2s2, 2p6, 3s2. This brings us up to 12. So we've got to find homes for six more. So we're going to go 3p and thankfully p subshell can hold six. So we're going to stick them all in there and that's argon calcium very similar it's just building on it 1s2 2s2 2p6 3s oh, that's a bit of an 8 but it should be an s 3s2 3p6 and if you remember the table from before you actually have to fill up 4s before you do 3 D. So we're going to put our last two into 4S. So that's what you would get for that one. Alrighty. So the reason we're focusing on electrons is electrons contribute significantly to the actual properties of an atom. So we find that atoms that actually have the same number of what we call valence uh, electrons. I'll just move one. 
some of the valence electrons, there we go, uh, which are just electrons in the outermost shell. These uh, atoms actually share chemical properties. And so there's a little bit of information we can get from the periodic table about our um, about the number of electrons and shells that we have. For instance, the elements group, the column that it's in, actually tells you the number of valence electrons it has. Now, there is a bit of a trick to this because whilst group one and group two are very easy, group one, uh, all of them have one valence electron, and group two, all of them have two valence electrons. When we jump over the transition metals, and the transition metals fill groups three through to 12, and in case you're not sure what I'm talking about, these are scandium, titanium, vanadium, chromium, manganese, iron, cobalt, nickel, nickel zinc, uh, copper, and zinc. That's a mouthful there. Uh, they they don't fit this pattern, so we actually have to ignore them. And when we jump to the columns that um, you have boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, uh, helium, and sort of neon at the top there, when we jump to these guys, they're actually groups 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18. And you have to apply a slightly different technique to getting the number of valence electrons. So for groups 13 through 18, you actually have to take 10 off that number. So if they're in group, if they're in group 13, they've got three valence electrons. If they're in group 14, they've got four valence electrons. If they're in group 15, they've got five valence electrons. If they're in group 16, they've got six valence electrons. If they're in group 18, they've got eight valence electrons. And, and group 17 would have seven valence electrons. So there is a bit of a trick beyond groups one and two with that. It's not a particularly hard trick. It's just something you need to be aware of if you're going to try and use the periodic table to tell you how many valence electrons there are in an atom. So that's the thing we can get from the group that it's in. The row that it's in, that's the um, the period is the other name for that. The row is also called the period. That tells us how many shells they are. So if they're hydrogen or helium, which are in row one, they have one valence. Sorry, not one valence, one, one shell. If they're in row two, which is lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and neon, they have two shells. If they're in three, so sodium, magnesium, aluminium, silicon, phosphorus, sulfur, chlorine, and argon, they have three shells. And for, row four has four shells, row five has five shells. So that one's actually pretty easy as long as you know what row they're in. Um, just remember that hydrogen and the helium actually are row one. Don't miss out on them because sometimes our peri periodic tables can have them sort of um, – moved and it's not obvious they're the first row so just be aware that hydrogen and helium are actually row one but once you know what uh, row an element is in you know how many shells it has and from there you can work out subshells and beyond so have a look at the information i've got here i've got lithium it's in group one in period two pause the video and i want you to write down how many shells lithium has from that information and how many valence electrons it should have as well so pause the video now. Alrighty, so did you manage to work it out? Well, if we go by what we were just looking at, we know that we can tell the number of shells from the period or the row number of the element. And so this is period two, so it must have two shells. There you go, that's how you do that. As for valence electrons, valence electrons are based on the group it's in. If groups one and two, they're nice and easy. That's the number of valence electrons. 13 through to 18, you have to take 10 off the number. But this is group one, so it must have one valence electron. There we go. That's it. That's all you had to do to answer that question. So how the subshells fit into the periodic table is actually really interesting. And the structure and the way the periodic table actually looks is actually completely reflective of those subshells. So you can see we have one S up the top with hydrogen and helium. And this section over here is all our S orbitals. Over here, these all have P orbitals that are being filled. D orbitals here and our lanthanides and actinides are actually the um, F subshells. Sorry, not orbital subshells. So this is actually how it fits in. So if you're talking about sulfur and you want to know what the last subshell is in sulfur, it's going to be 3P. Okay, it's in the third row and it's in part of the P block over here. Whereas if you're talking about potassium, potassium's last electron would be going into 4S. All right. So that's sort of just how the structure is of the periodic table is connected to um, subshells and all of that.
All right. There's an activity here for you to do. Uh, we've got an example down the bottom that I'll go through in a moment. But basically, you need to look at the electronic configurations. You need to name the atom. You need to identify what period it's going to be in and the group that it's going to be in. So we're going to take what we did last time where we actually looked at something and identified how many valence electrons it had and how many shells it had. We're going to flip that and we're going to go backwards uh, and actually look at those pieces of information to work out what period it's in and what group it's in. So down here we have our example. Uh, we did lithium earlier, so we're doing lithium again. Uh, and the way you can work out that it is lithium is count the little numbers up here. So we've got 2 plus 1 is 3. And that tells me there are 3 electrons. And because there's 3 electrons, it must be lithium. All right, so how do I then work out what period it's in? Well, the period is the same as the number of shells. Now, don't fall into the trap of counting every single thing. This one's pretty easy because it is only two subshells. But if I want to know the actual number of shells, I have to look at the big number at the front. So the big number at the front also happens to say two. So it must be in period two. Now, for the last bit, group. Group is connected to the number of valence electrons. So what I want to do is I want to look in the last shell, which happens to be uh, 2s. Um, watch out for some of the ones over here that you're not looking at just the subshell. For example, uh, yeah, for B over here, the last shell is actually 3, and that includes the S and P subshell, so you need to take them together. Over here, however, we only have one subshell in that shell, so we're just going to look there. It only has one electron, and if it has one electron at its last shell, it must be in group one. Okay, pause the video and work through the next lot over here. All right, hope you got through that. So let's go through, let's do A. So A is uh, going to be, you've got 2 plus 4. 10, 11, that's going to be sodium. So, all right, it's a bit tricky to write with a mouse, unfortunately. But so we've got sodium, it is in going to be uh, in period uh, one, we've got two and then three, so it must be in period three. Okay, and to work out what group it's in, we have to work out how many valence electrons it has. It also only has in its last shell, which is shell three, uh, one subshell with one electron. So that must put it in group one. Alrighty, so that's the first one. B, looking at this, we have uh, 2, 4, 10, 12, 17. So if I look at my periodic table, 17 is chlorine. I'm going to save myself some time. I'm just going to write CL for chlorine. Okay, and to work out what period it's found in, we need to look at the end here. We need to know how many shells, not subshells, but shells it has. So we've got one, then these are two, and this is three. So it's got three shells, so it must be period three. Alrighty, so just like sodium, except you can see here that's even though it's got an extra subshell because it's still part of the same shell. It is in period three. Now, for its valence electrons, we need to look at shell three. Uh, that is both the S and the P subshells. And we're going to look and go, okay, we've got two here and we've got five here. That's a total of seven. Now, this is where things get tricky. It's not in group seven. All right. Those with seven valence electrons are actually in group 17. All right. So there we go. So that's B. All right. C. Same idea, we've got 2, 4, 10, 12, 18, 20. Hopefully by now you're starting to remember that uh, 20 is calcium. So we're going to go C, A. And we're going to look at this uh, in terms of shells. We've got one, we've got these are two, this is three, and then we go all the way up to four, so it must be in period four. As for its uh, group, we're going to look at period... Uh, shell four and it's only got two electrons and there's only uh, the four s so if it's only got two valence electrons it's one of our nice easy ones it must be in group two so there we go there are our answers for that section all right let's jump to the next bit so 
That's what we need to do when we're talking about atoms. But atoms don't always stay atoms. Sometimes they lose or they can gain electrons. And when this happens, we're talking about an ion. Now, this isn't overly difficult. And generally what happens is atoms, if they're not uh, particularly stable or they really want to change and they want to become an ion, they're doing it to get stable. And what ends up happening is they're either going to gain or lose electrons so that they can get an electronic configuration that's exactly the same as the closest noble gas. For instance, the closest noble gas to hydrogen would be helium. The closest noble gas to lithium is also helium, but hydrogen goes up in the periodic table, uh, whereas lithium goes down. Now, hydrogen, I should add, is actually quite a funny one, and it tends to just lose its electrons, even though that means it um, isn't like helium. And that's just because hydrogen's a bit of an odd bod and it does things a little bit differently. Um, another example would be fluorine. Fluorine's nearest noble gas is neon. And then you've got sodium, whose noble gas is also neon. But sodium needs to gain electrons to become ne like neon. It doesn't, sorry, it doesn't become neon. It just becomes like neon with its electrons. And sodium needs to actually lose an electron to become like neon with its electrons. So depending on the kind of element they are, they're either going to gain electrons or they're going to lose electrons as they're trying to become the nearest um, noble gas in terms of the electron configuration. So the number of protons doesn't change. So they don't actually become the noble gas. They just end up with a lovely set of electrons like a noble gas. And the reason noble gases are noble and they don't react with things is because they tend to have a full outer shell. And that's what all these other atoms are trying to get. And that's why they'll lose or gain electrons. So if you need to do the electronic configuration for an ion, um, at the most basic level, really just write out the normal electron configuration and then adjust it uh, for how many electrons it's either gained or lost. Now, so I've got sodium down here. Sodium normally has 11 electrons. So normally it's 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s1. But sodium as an ion, it wants to get as close to being like a neon as possible. And the reason it does this is it wants a full outer shell and it's easier for it to lose one electron than it is for it to try and gain seven other electrons. So it loses that 3s1 electron. And so if you write out the electronic configuration for sodium as an ion, it only has 10 electrons. So it's actually just 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. All right, I've got four here for you to give a go. Uh, like I said, do the normal electron configuration and then you need to change up what it's or how many electrons it's got. So for example, if you've got a plus, that means you need to get rid of electrons and however many electrons are there. If you've got a minus, you need to add in electrons and you add in how, however many are there. Now, if you have a symbol by itself, a plus or a minus, that just means one. So no number, it just means one. Alrighty, pause the video and give this a go. Alrighty, so let's have a go through these answers. We'll do magnesium. We've got, uh, got non-working pen. Right, one S two, sorry, I should say magnesium has 12 electrons. So we're gonna go one S two, two, that's not a two. That's a two. Two S two, uh, two P six. We're at ten, and then three S two. Now this would be magnesium's normal configuration, but this is a magnesium ion, so it's magnesium two plus. And remember, I said if it's a plus, you have to get rid of electrons. How many do we, do we get rid of? Well, we get rid of two. So that means we get rid of these last two, which are in three S two. So we're going to get rid of all of this. We don't need that. And so this would be your answer. 1s2, 2s2, 2p6 for magnesium. Okay, I'm going to draw an arrow. We're going to do chlorine here. So chlorine is uh, 17 electrons. So that's going to be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. Okay, so we've got 10, uh, 3s2. Two, that's 12, 3p5. And that brings us to a total of 17. All right. But this is chlorine negative. So it actually doesn't look like this. And remember I said it's a negative, so it's going to gain an electron. And we have to add that electron on at the end. So instead of being 3p5, it's actually 3p6. All right. So that's actually what chlorine would look like. It looks a bit different. 
All right, we'll do oxygen now. Oxygen normally has eight electrons. So it would normally be 1s2, 2s2, 2p, sorry, p4. And that's our eight electrons. But we've got a minus here, so we need to add electrons. And we need to add two electrons. So we go 1s2, 2s2, 2p. And then we're going to add two to this. So 4 plus 2 is 6. I'm going to get rid of that. And we're going to write six and that's our oxygen ion electronic configuration all right we'll draw an arrow over here for beryllium beryllium normally has four electrons so normally beryllium is 1s2 2s2 and that's all it is but this is beryllium 2 plus remember a plus means you need to get rid of electrons so we're going to get rid of how many we're going to get rid of two which happens to be 2s2 so we're going to get rid of all of them and we're left with just that for beryllium all right that's what you need to do when you're writing out the electronic configuration for ions all righty so we're going to jump on um, and we're going to talk about what happens to electrons because you see atoms can hold on to their electrons and just stay as an atom. They could lose them and become a positive ion. They could gain electrons and become a negative ion. But sometimes electrons do other things and they move around in a different way and they move around within the atom, not between atoms. And when they move around within the atom, this produces some pretty cool effects. Um, I want you to think of fireworks and the really cool colors. Now, those cool colors are actually generated because we're using uh, a bit of chemistry there to mess with uh, the electrons of some atoms. So electrons, when they're in the subshell or the shell that they normally found in, we talk about this as being their ground state. But if you give them extra energy, they end up moving into an excited state. But the thing is that excited state isn't actually a sustainable thing. And so they fall out of it really quickly. Um, one sort of funny way of thinking about this, it's like um, having different suburbs and having a really rich suburb that people might live in with a lot of money and that sort of thing. And, you know, you need a lot of money to buy a house there. But then you might have somebody who lives in a really poor suburb. And so they live there because they don't have much money, so they can't buy a house in a nice suburb. But they suddenly come into a whole heap of money. And what they go and do is they go and buy the most expensive house they can um, in the really expensive suburb and they move in. But, you know, they're not very good with money. And so suddenly they've got no money and they have to move back out of that lovely expensive suburb back to their um, old poorer suburb, something like that. Um, that's kind of what's happening here. You've got electrons um, in their normal shells. But if they actually get and absorb enough energy, because those subshells are energy levels, they can actually move between those energy levels and so they can move up shells or subshells so they might go from three to four or three s to four s something like that now like i was saying the problem with this is when they jump up to that higher energy level it's actually not stable and we say it's in an excited state um think preppies with red cordial or, or and lots of sugary lollies you know it's not sustainable there's going to be a crash and they're going to come back down so those electrons don't stay in the unstable state they actually return to what we call, like I said, the ground state, which is the original shell. But the thing is, and you should remember, energy can't be created, nor can it be destroyed. So that energy that got absorbed, um, that caused it to move up in shells, actually has to go somewhere. It can't just disappear into nothing. So what happens is it releases that extra energy, but it releases it in the form of light. Now, depending on what the energy difference was between those shells, the energy that gets released uh, as light gets released in different wavelengths. And it just so happens that as long as they're within a certain range, we perceive those different wavelengths as different colors. And so if we burn certain things, we can uh, trigger those electrons to jump up and then fall back down energy levels and they'll release light and they'll release it as colored light. So we end up burning stuff and it produces pretty colors. Like we've got in our picture here, we've got somebody burning something in a Bunsen burner uh, and they're producing this lovely greeny blue flame um, and because they've got that color flame it's probably copper that they're burning in it an overview of what we're talking about here would be this diagram so our red dots are our electrons the black lines are the energy levels so energy gets absorbed by the electron the electron then moves up a shell but that's not stable and it's not sustainable so the electron ends up falling back down and moving down a shell 
And what happens to that energy? Well, the energy gets emitted by the electron and it gets emitted as colored light. And so you can get some pretty colored flames like the ones down the bottom here. Well, how do you show that would be the next question. What do I actually need to do when it comes to writing out my electronic configuration? All right, so electronic configuration for ground versus excited state. The way we first learned to write these out, that would be the ground state. So when we're talking about grounds, sorry, the ground state for a sodium atom, it's 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s1, just the standard way you would write it out. However, the first excited state you can get is by promoting a 3s electron to the 3p orbital. So you would then write 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3p1, and you'd actually skip over the 3s because that electron that was in 3s is now moved up to 3p. With this, uh, if you're asked to write out the excited state of an atom, as long as you show one or more electrons moving up in subshells or shells, that's acceptable for what we're doing at this level. So you don't need to stress too much about there being one specific answer as long as you're able to demonstrate electrons moving uh, up energy levels. That is what we're looking for when we talk about this uh, sort of thing. All right. So have a bit of a go with this one. It says write the electronic configuration of a silicon atom in the excited state. Now silicon is uh, 14, so it has 14 electrons that you need to find homes for. So if I were you, what I would do is I'd write out the normal configuration of silicon and then I'd go through and go, okay, I need to promote one of these electrons or I need to promote two of these electrons to a higher energy level and then rewrite it like that. So pause the video and give that a go. Alrighty, so silicon normal. Silicon normally has 14. And normally it is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s. We've got 2, 4, 6, 10. So we need to find homes for another 4. So we're going to put 2 here. 3p2. If you were to do this in an excited state, you might write something that's like 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, and then maybe you'll go and promote these two all the way up to 4s2. Okay, this is not the standard way of oh that's not a very good circle this is not the standard way of writing uh silicon's electronic configuration but it is an acceptable way of writing it in an excited state so just be aware of the differences there Alrighty, this pretty much brings us to the end of this PowerPoint. And so there is another activity that you can do on the next slide if you'd like to, but it's not compulsory. Otherwise, I'm going to leave you there. Please remember to ask your teacher if you've got any questions about what we've covered. And if you weren't sure of something, feel free to go back over the video, speed it up, slow it down, whatever works for you. Uh, thank you for listening.